I'll give you all the intro since you are here. You're, you're the people who are here on time. Is that the, I'm going to read from a, um, a short, really pretty short story called Hungerford Bridge, um, which is set in London and was inspired by a couple of years ago when I was there and staying with my partner, John, and Amanda Palmer, who's a musician and performer, who's a friend of um, his, was also staying for a while. And Amanda has this kind of cult following. She was part one half of the Dresden Dolls. And anyway, so she has some very unusual friends. And one night, this friend of hers came for dinner, who was this most, like, this beautiful, but extremely eccentric young man who, um, was dressed like an Aubrey Beardsley dandy. And he had, I mean, he really was. He was quite extraordinary. And he talked like one, too. He was really, really a dandy. And I couldn't eat, I could not make the character in this book so much like this guy, because nobody would ever believe that somebody like this could exist. But the most remarkable thing about him, apart from his stories, some of which I put in here, which were true, his anecdotes, he had a little tiny mustache, and it curled into a perfect circle. So it looked like a little tiny pair of spectacles. I've never seen that before or since. He must have spent a great deal of time just every day, you know, with mustache wax doing that. So anyway, so that guy, uh, I think his name was Max. Within a very few days, I started, I sat down and write, wrote this story because he was way too good of a character to, you know, not rip off. Does Max know that he's no, I only met him that once. I, you know, we, we had dinner with him, and he was he was quite a raconteur. So he was just telling, you know, and he was he was young, maybe in his twenties, and very kind of vain, quite mannered. But um, and then we went to see Amanda's performance that night with him, and then he, you know, then he went back to the underworld or wherever he came from, <laughs> and I never saw him again. So anyway, so this I'm going to read the story. Um, uh, this is for Max, wherever he is. So. And this is called Hungerford Bridge. I hadn't heard from Miles for several months when he wrote to ask if I wanted to get together for lunch. Of course I did, and several days later I met him in a, noiseful, a noisy, cheerful restaurant at South Bank. It was early February, London still somewhat dazed by the heavy snowfall that had recently paralyzed the city. The Thames seemed a, a river of lead. A black skim of ice made the sidewalks dangerous. I'd seen another man fall as I'd walked from Waterloo Station, and I wished I'd worn something warmer than the old wool greatcoat I'd had since college. But once settled into the seat across from Miles, all that fell away. You're looking well, Robbie, he said, smiling. You too. He smiled again, his pale eyes still locked with mine, and I felt that familiar frisson, caught between chagrin and joy that I'd been summoned. We'd met decades earlier at Cambridge, if I hadn't been a Texan, with the faint gloss of exoticism conferred by my accent and Justin Boots, I doubt if he would have bothered with me at all. But he did. Being chosen as a friend by Miles carried something of the unease of being hypnotized. Even now, I felt as I imagine a starling would staring into the seed black eyes of a crate. It wasn't just his beauty, still remarkable enough to turn heads in the restaurant, or his attire, though these would have been enough. Miles looked and dressed as though he'd stepped from a Beardsley drawing, wearing bespoke Edwardian suits and vintage Clark shoes he found at charity shops. He still wore his graying hair longish, artfully swept back from a delicate face to showcase a mustache that, on special occasions, would be waxed and curled so precisely it resembled a tiny pair of spectacles perched above his upper lip. <laughs> on anyone else, this would have looked twee. Actually, on Miles it looked twee. But his friends forgave him everything, even his drunken recitations from Peter Pan, in which he'd played the lead as a boy. <laughs> I knew my place in the Neverland hierarchy. I was Smee, <laughs> sentimental and loyal, slightly ridiculous. I doubt that even as an infant, Miles had ever been ridiculous. His demeanor was at once aloof and good-natured, as though he'd wandered into the wrong party, but was too well-mannered well to embarrass his host or the other guests by bringing this fact to their attention. His mother was a notorious groupie who was living out her twilight years in Exeter. His father could have been any one of a number of major or minor rock stars whose luxurious hair and petulant mouth Miles had inherited. Back at Cambridge, he'd scattered offhand anecdotes the way other students scattered cigarette ash. 
His great aunt had been Diana Mitford's best friend. As a child, Miles had tea with Mitford, and upon the aunt's death, he inherited a sterling lemon squeezer engraved with the initials A.H. Once, camping with a friend on Dartmoor, he'd found a dead, a dead stag slung over the branches of a tree, the footprints of an enormous cat in the boggy earth beneath. A German head of state had filleted him in a public men's room in Marrakesh. He'd been Jean Moreau's lover when he was 13, and had his first play produced at the Donmore Warehouse two years later. That sort of thing. Now he gazed at me and unexpectedly laughed in delight. Robbie, it really is so good to see you. When the waiter arrived, Miles asked for a Malbec that was not on the wine list, but which appeared and was open with a flourish several minutes later. We'll pour, thanks. Miles gently shooed the waiter off. Here. He filled my glass, then his own. To happy endings. Over lunch, we gossiped about old friends. Kevin Bailey had lost everything in the crash and was rumored to be living under an assumed name in Portugal. Missy Severance had some work done with a plastic surgeon Miles knew and looked fabulous. Khalil Devon's third wife was expecting twins. And you've been okay? Miles refilled my glass. You really look great, Robbie, and, and happy. You even look relatively happy. I shrugged. I am happy. Happy enough, anyway. I mean, it doesn't take much. I've still got a job at any rate, and my rent hasn't gone up. Hmm. For a minute, Miles stared at me thoughtfully. I was used to these silences, which usually preceded an account of recent disturbances among some subset of sexual, sexual specialists in a town I'd never heard of. Now, however, Miles just tapped his lower lip. Finally, he tilted his head, nodded, and gave me a sharp look. Come on, he said. He removed a sheaf of notes from his wallet and shoved them under the empty wine bottle, pulled on his fawn-colored overcoat and wide burden hat as he headed for the door. Let's get out of here. We walked across Hungerford Bridge in the intermittent rain, skirting puddles and pockets of slush. Below us, the Thames reflected empty, parchment-colored sky. When I looked back across the water, the buildings on the opposite bank seemed etched upon a vast blank scroll, a barge's wake providing a single ink stroke. Gulls wheeled and screamed. The air smelled of petrol and snow. Beside me, Miles walked slowly, heedless of damp staining the tips of his oxblood, sho oxblood shoes. I think I'm going away, he said at last. Away? Where? I don't know, um, Australia maybe, or, or Tierra del Fuego, someplace warm. Tierra del Fuego's not warm. He laughed. Well, that settles it then, Australia. <laughs> We'd reached the other side of the bridge. Miles stopped, staring down past his dank alley. On the far side of the alley, a wedge of green gleamed between grimy buildings and cars rushing past the Thames, the intricate warren of doors and tunnels that led into the embankment tube station. I always noted this bit of park as I rushed to or from work, a verdant mirage suspended between Victoria Embankment and the Royal of Central <coughs> London, like a shard of stained glass window that had survived the bombing of its cathedral. Depending on the season, the sidewalk leading into it might be rain-washed or sifted with autumn leaves beneath a huge ivy-covered plane tree. Now the swatch of green glowed, lamp-like, in the cold drizzle. Let's go down there, said Miles. I want to show you something. We wound our way through the pedestrian tunnel and downstairs into the street. A flower stall stood outside the subway entrance. It smelled like a garden after rain or a wedding. A black plaid girl moved slowly among her wares, rearranging delphiniums and setting up placards with prices scrawled on them. Miles tipped his hat to her as we passed. She smiled and the sweet, dance, sweet, sweet sense of damp earth and freesia trailed us into the park. You know, I've never been here. I drew alongside Miles. All these years, I've just seen it from up there. I pointed to where the bridges spanned and disappeared behind a crosshatch of brick and peeling billboards. I don't even know what it's called. Victoria Embankment Park. Miles stopped and looked around like a fox testing the air. I haven't been here in a while myself. For a few minutes, we walked in silence. The park was much larger than I thought. There was an ornate water gate to one side, relic of a Tudor mansion now long gone. Several maintenance men smoked and laughed outside a brick utility building. 
A few other people strolled along the sidewalk, hunched against the frigid rain. Businessmen, a young woman walking a small dog. Tall rhododendrons clustered alongside the path, leaves glossy as carven jade, and box trees that smelled mysteriously of my childhood. This was all the tidal shore of the Thames. Miles gestured at the river. They filled it in around 1851, thus embankment. I always wonder what they'd find if they dug it up again. We continued on. Signs warned us from the grass. A large statue of Robert Burns stared at us impassively, and I wondered if this was what Miles wanted me to see. But we walked past Burns, past the immense plane trees shedding bark like a lizard's skin, past an outdoor cafe open despite the weather, and some wildly incongruous looking palms with long spear-shaped leaves. Perhaps a hundred feet away, Cleopatra's needle rode above this traffic, guarded by two patient sphinxes. Here, this is as good a spot as any. Miles walked to a bank and s bench and sank, sat. I settled next to him, tugging my collar against the cold. I should have worn a hat. He didn't even glance at me. His eyes were fixed on a small, curved patch of garden on the other side of the path, two steps away. Forlorn cowslips with limp stems and papery leaves had been recently planted at the garden's edge. The wind carried the cold scent of overturned earth and a, a fainter, sweeter fragrance. Lilies of the valley, though I saw none in bloom. Here, too, the grass was close cropped, though there were several small depressions where the roots of a great plane tree thrust through the dirt. Moles, I thought, or maybe the marks of older plantings. Behind it all ran a crumbling brick wall about six feet in height, topped by the knotty, intertwined branches of an espalier <coughs> tree growing on the other side. This, along with the ancient plane tree, made our bench feel part of a tiny enclave. The sounds of traffic grew muffled. People passing us on the main path just a few yards off wanted seemed to lower their voices. It's lovely, I murmured. Hush, said Miles. He continued to gaze fiercely at the green sward across from us. I leaned back against the bench and tried to get comfortable. The brick wall provided some shelter from the rain, but I still shivered. After a few minutes, Miles moved so that he pressed against my side and I sighed in thanks, grateful for the warmth. We sat there for a long time. Over an hour, I noted when I glanced at my watch, though Miles frowned so vehemently I didn't check again. Now and then I glanced at him from the corner of my eye. He still stared resolutely at the patch of garden, his expression remote as Cleopatra's sphinxes. Another hour might have passed. The wind shifted. The rain stopped and it felt warmer. The light slanting through the linden branches grew tinged with violet. Beside me, Miles abruptly drew a deeper breath as his body tensed. His face grew rigid, his eyes widened, and his mouth parted. I must have moved as well. He hissed warningly, and my gaze flashed back to the swath of green. At the base of the plane tree, something moved. A falling leaf, I thought, or a ribbon of peeling bark trapped between the tangled roots. Then it gave an odd, sudden hop, and I thought it was some sort of wren, or, or even a large frog, or perhaps a child's toy. The something scurried across the turf and stopped. For the first time, I saw it clearly. A creature the size of my bald fist. A hedgehog, surely. Pointed snout, upraised spines, a tiny outthrust arrow of a tail, legs invisible beneath its rounded torso. But it was green a brilliant jewel-like green, like the carapace of a scarab beetle. Its spikes weren't spikes at all, but tiny overlapping scales, or maybe feathers shot through with iridescent mauve and amethyst as it moved. Its eyes were the rich damson of a pansy's inner petals, and, and as it nosed at the grass, mm -hmm. I saw that its snout ended in a beak, like an echidna's, the same deep purple as its eyes. I gasped and felt Miles stiffen as the creature froze and ra raised its head slightly. A moment later, it looked down and once more began poking at the grass. My heart raced. I shut my eyes, trying to calm myself, but also to determine if this was a dream or some weird drunken flashback inspired by Miles. But when I looked again, the creature was still there, scurrying obliviously between tree roots and cowslips. Its beak-like snout poked into the soft black earth and occasionally emerged with a writhing worm or beetle impaled upon it. Once, the wind stirred a dead leaf and startled, the creature halted. 
Its scales rose to form a stiff, brilliantly co co colored armor, a farthingale glimmering every shade of violet and green. Vermilion claws protruded from beneath its body. A bright droplet appeared at the end of the pointed beak as it made an ominous, low humming sound, like a swarm of bees. A minute crept by, and when no predator appeared, the scales flattened, the shining claws withdrew, and the creature scurried as before. Sometimes it came to the very edge of the garden plot where upright paving stones formed an embankment. I would hold my breath then, terrified that I'd frighten it. But the creature only thrust its brick fruitlessly between the cracks and finally turned back. In all that time, I neither heard nor saw another person save Miles, silent as a statue beside me. I was so focused upon the creature's solitary hunt that I might have been bludgeoned or robbed and never known it. Gradually, the afternoon wore away. Gradually, the world about us took on a lavender cast that deepened from hyacinth, the heliotrope, to the leaden, enveloping gloom of London's winter twilight. Without warning, the creature lifted its head from where it had been feeding, turned, scurried back toward the plane tree, and disappeared into one of the holes there. I blinked and held my breath again, willing it to reappear. It never did. After a minute, Miles leaned back against the bench and stretched. He looked at me and smiled, yet his eyes were sad, more than sad. He appeared heartbroken. What the hell was that? I demanded. <laughs> Two teenagers walking side by side and texting glanced at me and laughed. The Emerald Foliate, Miles replied. What the hell is the Emerald Foliate? He shrugged. What you saw, that's it. Don't get pissy at me, it's all I know. <laughs> he jumped to his feet and bounced up and down on his heels. Jesus, I'm frozen. Let's get out of here. I'll walk you back across the bridge. My leg was asleep, so it was a moment before I could run to catch up with him. For fuck's sake, Miles, you have to tell me what that was. What that was all about. I told you all I know. He shoved his hands into his pockets, shivering now himself. God, it's cold. It's called the Emerald Folia. Who calls it the Emerald Folia? Well, me. <laughs> and the person who showed me. And now you. But who showed you? And are there more? I mean, it should be in a museum or a zoo or, Christ, I don't know. Something. Are they studying it? Why doesn't anyone know about it? Miles stopped beneath the overhang at the entrance to the tube station. He leaned against the wall out of the wind and a short distance from the throngs hurrying home from work. Nobody knows because nobody knows, Robbie. You know and I know and the person who told me knows. And I guess if he or she is still alive, the person who told him knows. But that's it. That's all. In the whole entire world, we're the only ones. His eyes glittered with excitement, but also tears. He wiped them away unashamed and smiled. I wanted you to know, Robbie. I wanted you to be the next one. I rubbed my forehead in impatient and disbelief, swore loudly, and then aligned myself against the wall at his side. I was desperately trying to keep my temper. Next one what, I, find, I said at last. The next one who knows. That's how it works. Someone shows you, just like I showed you, but then, his voice broke and he went on. But then, the other person, the first person, we never go there again. We never see it again, ever. You mean it only comes out once or twice a year? He shook his head sadly. No, it comes out all the time. I, I mean, I assume it does, but who knows? I've only seen it twice. The first time was when someone showed me, and now the second time, the last time, with you. But I took a deep breath and fumbled instinctively in my pocket for a cigarette, though I'd quit years ago. Here. Miles withdrew a leather ci cigarette case, opened it, and offered one to me. Took one for himself, and then lit both. I inhaled deeply and waited before speaking again. Okay, so you showed it to me, and somebody showed it to you. Who? When? I can't tell you, but a long time ago, right after college, I guess. Why can't you tell me? I just can't. Miles stared at the pavement. It's not allowed. Who doesn't allow it? I don't know. It's just not done, and you, 
He lifted his head to gaze at me, his eyes burning. You can't tell anyone either, Robbie, ever, not until it's your turn and you show someone else. And then it's over? I never see it again? He nodded. That's right, you, you never see it again. I felt a surge of impatience and despair. Just twice in my whole life? He smiled. That's more than most people get. More than anyone gets, except for you and me. And whoever showed you, and whoever showed him or her? Miles finished his cigarette, dropped it, and ground it fastidiously beneath the tip of one oxblood shoe. I did the same, and together we began to walk back upstairs. So how long has this been going on? We stepped onto Hungerford Bridge, and I stopped to look down at the fractal view of the park, no longer green but yellowish from the glow of crime lights. A hundred years? Thousands? I don't know. Um, maybe. I mean, the park wasn't always there, but something was there before the embankment. The river, enormous houses. But I think it's gone on longer than that. And no one else knows? No one else knows. He gazed at the park and then glanced over his shoulder at people rushing across the bridge. Someone bumped me, murmured sorry, and trudged on. Unless everyone does, and they're all very good at keeping a secret. He laughed, and we started walking again. Why did you decide to, to tell me? I don't know. I've known you so long. You, you seem like someone who'd appreciate, appreciate it. And also, you can keep a secret, like you never told about Brian and that dog in Sussex. I winced at the memory. Is there a set time when you tell the next person, or do you just make up your mind and do it? You can tell whoever you want, whenever you want. Some people do right away, the next day or a week later, but I think most people wait. That's what I was told, anyway. Though you don't want to wait too long. I mean, you don't want to wait till you're so ancient and infirm that you forget about it or die before you tell the next one. I must have looked stricken because he laughed again and put his arm around me. Oh, no, I'm fine, Robbie, I swear. I just, you know. I decided it was time for a change of scenery. Warmer climbs, adventures, a new career in a new town. We'd reached the far side of the bridge. I'll leave you here. Miles glanced at his mobile, read a message, and smiled slightly before glancing at me. I'm not falling off the end of the earth, Robbie. I'll be in touch. Till then. He raised a finger and touched it to my lips. Not a word. He kissed my cheek in farewell spun on his heel and began striding back across the bridge. I watched him go, his fawn-colored greatcoat and wide-brimmed hat, until night swallowed him. For a few minutes I stood there, gazing past the bridge's span to the dark river, dark river below, the image of a gem-like creature flickering across my vision, and Miles's kiss still warm upon my cheek. Then I turned, head down, as a blast of wind blew up from the underground station and hurried to catch my train. So if you go to if you go over Hungerford Bridge and you go down to the Victoria Embankment Park, that place is right there where I describe it with the, the brick wall and the spalier tree and this little bench and you could sit there and you watch the little holes. And if you're very lucky. <laughs> so any questions, anything at all? The book is not out yet. Is it? This is just yes. Oh, I'm sorry. This is it, it's it was originally published in conjun the literary magazine Conjunctions. A couple of years ago, and it's in—it's um, just come out, and it's in Errantry, which just came out like oh, within days. Day. So it's it's here. Yeah. This collection is here uh, with a great Uccello cover. Um, so I get to work with all the really great artists. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it's in there. Um, so thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.